In this talk, I basically discuss about this paper. This paper was done with uh, Shumanto Chakraborty and Professor Norish Dodic. Uh, strong cosmic censorship conjecture state that this time cannot be extended beyond the Cauchy object with square interval connections. This conjecture is always hold true for an asymptotically flat black hole because the exponential uh, blue shifts towards the Cauchy origin always dominate over the pearl of fallout in the late times. However, this conjecture is not always hold true for the asymptotic digital space times. Because the late time fall of perturbations mode filling into black hole which exponential is small which may dominate over the exponential rise through the blue shifts near the Cauchy horizons. In the mathematical form of is this form. The perturbation mode has exponential fall this form where omega is the imaginary part of the lowest line perturbation mode whereas the exponential blue shifts near the Cauchy origin result into these forms where kappa minus is the surface gravity as with the Cauchy origins. Now you just square this and compare these two terms you see that when omega i is less than kappa minus my uh, 2 that means omega uh, that means <coughs> this term is dominated then perturbation mode will be diverges respected to this strong cosmic sensitive conjecture. When omega i is greater than kappa minus by 2 that means this term is, will be dominating that means this perturbation mode which will be regular and leading to a violation of the strong cosmic sensitive conjecture. Recently in this paper they have shown that a rotating BTZ black hole indeed violate strong cosmic sensitive conjecture. We want to see whether one can restore strong cosmic sensitive conjecture for a charged BTZ black hole both in general relativity and beyond. Okay. The char charged BTZ black hole which is nothing but 2 plus 1 dimensional black hole where the metric is look like this form here m is the mass of the black hole q is the charge of the black hole uh, here m and q uh, as dimensionless quantity and this uh, lambda is related to this form where l is the ADS, ADS radius and lambda is the cosmological constant. Uh, now, uh, sorry. Uh, now, in this from this metric, in when you get f r equal to, uh, f r equal to zero from there, you can see there is two horizons for this matrix. Here, r plus minus is uh, r minus is the Cauchy origin, and r plus is the event horizons. Here, uh, this a, this l omega plus and l omega minus is the Lambert functions, which is look like this form, and the both horizons only exist when this condition is hold true. Now, after oh sorry. After getting this uh, horizons, one can calculate this uh, surface gravity associated with the Cauchy horizons and this surface gravity associated with this Cauchy origin is look like this form. And the Lyapunov exponent which uh, uh, using photon sphere one can calculate Lyapunov exponent which is look like this form. And Lyapunov exponent for a charge which is black hole is look like this form. Uh, now, uh, this uh, one can calculate uh, beta which is nothing but omega i by kappa mi sorry uh, this omega omega okay sorry this omega i by kappa minus one can calculate this beta uh, using uh, i equal to limit acquisition which is nothing but beta equal to lambda by 2 kappa minus for a charge which is with black hole it look like this form. So from there one can calculate omega i by kappa minus analytically in, in the one con considering icon limit approximation using photon sphere mode. But that might be possible there is some mode which uh, which gets uh, beta is less value than this beta of photon sphere mode. So what we, we do in the same thing is the in numerically we consider a scalar field and part of this uh, and part of this metric we using this scalar field at this and this perturbation is governed by this Klein God equations box pi equal to 0. And this met uh, we, we have also assumed this uh, uh, volume adjunction of this perturbation scalar field which is look like this form. So if you put this in the this box pi equation the radial equation gives me this that forms. Where V effective is the effective potential which is look like this form we have, I have already discussed uh, a, if 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 are uh, the metric and L is the angular angular moment part, which is nothing but this e to the power i L phi. Okay, now uh, for oh sorry, for solving this second order Dipole's equation, we need two boundary conditions for solving this second order Dipole's equations. 
So we consider two uh, burning conditions. One is uh, the mode which is completely ingoing in the, at the horizons. And due to this black hole, uh, sorry, this black hole is, uh, if you calculate this black, uh, black hole and uh, this uh, Kisman scalar, you can see that this black hole is asymptotically ADS black hole. Because, uh, and also see that this cosmological constant here is negative. So that means there is ADS boundary is spagens. So at infinity, this, uh, this, uh, this part is gives zero. Using t, these two boundary conditions, one can calculate uh, this Quasimov mode and, uh, and, and also one can calculate the surface gravity. Sorry. Surface gravity uh, using uh, these equations. Uh, these equations. And from there, one can calculate this imaginary omega by kappa minus, whose minimum value gives you this beta. Well, we can calculate this thing. This is the purely identical value. And we have considered a different value of angular momentum, L equal to one, 0, 1, 2, and L equal to 10 for different value. And we have, for calculating this thing, we are considering this ADS length and uh, mass of the black hole equal to 1. Uh, and we see that, and also we see in the plot, we see that this lowest line curve, which is nothing but this curve, this identical value and L equal to 10 value, this lowest line curve is always this critical value less than half. That means this strong cosmic synthesis is respected for a charged BTJ black hole in the general relativity. We have considering this uh, thing for this, uh, for pure Lovelock case also. We are considering a charged BTJ black hole for in its order pure Lovelock cavity, where d w space size is d equal to 2n plus 1. The matrix is look like this form. Here we consider lambda is negative, m is the mass of the black hole, and q is the representative charge of the black hole. Uh, and the, this matrix, there is only two root, po do two real positive root possible when, uh, when lambda equal to negative. And then I, we just consider this thing for R plus and R minus, similar like BTZ black hole in general relativity. And we have co considering the same procedure for calculating beta using uh, Lepon of exponent and, uh, and this uh, icon and Emil approximation uh, identically. And we, uh, we see that, for, and here there is a N is, Oh, sorry. Here n is the Lovelock order. Uh, for, for different value of, we have considered for different value of n, n equal to 3 and n equal to 5. And we see that for different, and also we consider lambda equal to minus 0.1, m equal to mass of the black hole equal to 1. And we have considered, calculated this thing, image beta, image omega minus kappa minus identically. This is identical results. And we see that for for hard value of this Lovelock order, this, this value is more less than 0.5. So the higher value of this Lovelock order in strong cosmic synthesis is respected more strongly. Then we have calculated this thing for uh, numerical case also. Uh, in this case also similar like uh, BTZ black hole in general relativity. And we, we have calculated this thing and we see that this is the identical value. And in the here we consider different value of L. Uh, and here Q by Q max, Q max is the uh, ch ch charge when the black hole is extremal. Uh, and we, for calculating this numeric calculation, we have considered this Lovelock order is equal to three. If you are interested, you can calculate this for n equal to five or n equal to seven case also. Okay. And we see that here also, this uh, the lowest line curve which corresponding to this beta, this is this is this lowest line curves. This is always less than this critical value half. So the strong cosmic sensor is respected for a um, charge which is a black hole in the pure Lovelock case also. So we have calc summary. So we have calculated Poisson mode for charge BTZ black hole in general relativity as well as in pure Lovelock theory, both identically as well as numerically. We see that the, for both the case, the lowest line curve, which quantity, uh, which is this quantifies beta, which is always less than this critical value half. So the strong cosmic sensor is respected for a charge BTZ black hole, irrespective whether a solution of general relativity or pure Lovelock theory of gravity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiranjeev. A so. very good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sagarika Tripathi from IIT Madras. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for such a wonderful mini conference. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So I'll be talking about the <coughs> challenges and the possible resolutions in the generation of magnetic fields in inflationary models leading to features in the scalar power spectrum. 
So I guess you all have heard uh, Sri Ram talking yesterday about the features and how the features are generated in slow roll inflationary models and wha what is deviation from slow roll, etc. Uh, so I won't emphasize on those parts. I will just briefly put some lights on them. They, my talk will be based on these two of my works, which I have done with my collaborator, Devika Chaudhary, who is a postdoc at Swansea University, Rajiv Jain, who is a faculty at IISC, uh, Sriram, and uh, the next work is uh, another author is there, H.V. Raghavendra, who is a postdoc at Raman Research Institution. Uh, so the outline of my talk goes as follows. First, I will discuss the constraints on the magnetic fields present today. Then I will discuss the challenges in the generation of magnetic fields in single field inflationary models involving non-trivial dynamics which leads to features in the scalar power spectrum. Next I will discuss how we circumvent those challenges with the help of two field models and what are the imprints of these primordial magnetic fields on the cosmic microwave background spectra. Lastly I will conclude with a brief summary. So, in galaxies and cluster of galaxies, the observed strength of the magnetic fields are of order microgauss, which, which is coherent on length scales ranging from kiloparsec to megaparsec. Well, these magnetic fields are generated as the amplification of pre-existing weaker magnetic fields, otherwise known as the seed fields, by processes like dynamo mechanism. Well, these seed fields could have either astrophysical or cosmological origin. Now, this, this here, yeah. So this plot here describes the constraints, theoretical and observational constraints on the magnetic fields present today. Up to this line, uh, this line here, it is the theoretical bound, and these other uh, regions are the observational bound. We are specifically interested in these large scales because this is the observational scales of our interest, which are the CMB scales. So as you see, the lower bound here is of order 10 power minus 17 Gauss, and the upper bound here is of order 10 power minus 9 Gauss, which is uh, here the upper bound is obtained from CMB observations, while the lower bound is obtained from gamma ray observations. So now, such large scale magnetic fields can, uh, which are these large scale magnetic fields are present in the intergalactic medium voids and they can be considered as the seed fields as their presence in the voids won't be affected by the magnetohydrodynamical processes due to absence of any plasma. So if they are generated in the very early universe, they will be in their undistorted form until today. So one of the, uh, one of the epochs at which these, magnetic, these large scale magnetic fields could have been generated are during the inflationary epoch of the early universe. Now as you, almost of all of you might be knowing, inflation is a period of accelerated expansion of the early universe which has proposed to overcome the shortcomings of the hot big bang model. So now how magnetic fields can be generated during inflation is, we know that the standard electromagnetic action is conformally invariant. So if magnetic field of large scale magnetic fields are generated during inflationary epoch, so they will dilute and wash away and we will never be able to obtain the observational constraint that I have shown today. So in order to generate large scale magnetic fields during inflationary epoch, we need to couple the field, scalar field, which drives inflation, which is called as inflaton, with the electromagnetic field in such form. Now often an additional parity violating term is added to the action to generate helical magnetic fields. So these helical, in the helical magnetic fields, one of the polarization modes has a higher amplitude compared to the other. So now varying this action with respect to the Fourier modes, we can arrive at the equation of motion. And varying this action with respect to the metric tensor, we can arrive at the expression of this power spectrum. So, now, it is widely explored in the literature that for a form of the coupling function, which I have shown here, generally in literature, a simpler form is taken, which is the um, coupling function going as exponential of n, small n is a number, and n is the number of e-fold. So for n val this n becoming 2, we get a scale invariant power, magnetic power spectra of required strength, which leads to the current observed strength. But when we go to a more realistic scenario where magnetic, where inflation is driven by a scalar field, in those cases we need to construct model dependent coupling function. 
So what we have done is we have considered this differential equation which uh, governs the inflaton on field phi. We have solved this equation and using the solution of the field, the specifically the slow roll solution of the field, we have constructed the coupling function in such a way that it will lead to this form for and we, we will get a scale invariant spectrum for this n value here too. So here is a list of slow roll models that we have worked with and its corresponding potentials and these are the coupling function we have constructed solving using the slow roll solution of the field from this equation. Now as expected since we have kept in mind that we need a coupling function of this form and we have constructed the j of phi in such a in that manner. So as expected we have obtained the magnetic power spectra for both helical and non-helical case to be scale invariant and if for electric spectra for non-helical case there is a k-square behavior and the helical case there is a uh, scale nearly scale invariant behavior which has a similar amplitude of that of helical case and as you notice here these all amplitudes almost all of them can lead to the current observed strength if they are, the magnetic field is evolved through the evolution of the universe. Now uh, it is well known that the slow roll models are in well agreement with the CMB data. However, as Shida mentioned yesterday with the discovery of these black holes, there is a rising interest in understanding the primordial origin of the black holes and that leads to understand the models generate the inflationary models generating features in the scalar power spectrum. Another uh, model of interest is the models we generate which improves the fit to the CMB data. So for such models we have tried to study how the magnetic field can be generated and how what is the behavior of the power spectra. Well, as you see there are couple of models, uh, the power spectrum, the scalar power spectrum of couple of models we have shown here. So here in these three models there is a separation of power over large scales which is the CMB scale here and there is an enhancement of power over the small scale. Small scale. So these uh, models generate, can generate PBH and these models can uh, improve the fit to the CMB data. So now let us understand how magnetic fields can be generated in these models. So one such way is by introducing a step to the slow roll potential. So in this case we have considered um, the same coupling function that we have used earlier for the slow roll models and here we did not see much deviation from the behavior other than these bump like features over the intermediate scales. And also the amplitudes are well within the desired range. However, when we move on to the potentials involving point of inflection, we see that uh, so in these cases the field slowly loans down the potential and once it hits the point of inflection, um, uh, its velocity drops sharply. So here as you see it is a plot of epsilon 1 which is, which is a function of the velocity of the field. And in, so it's, as you see here these models are complicated to solve analytically so we have resorted to the numerics to obtain the uh, slow roll solution of the field and constructed the coupling function numerically by doing a polynomial fitting. So as you see when the field hits the point of inflection uh, its velocity sharply drops here which and when we you that is the field hardly evolves. So using that solution of the field when we construct the coupling function we see that we see that the coupling function becomes constant once the deviation from slow roll occur allowing a brief epoch of ultra slow roll. Now for these cases we see that there is a huge challenge. So here comes the challenge that I had talked in the beginning. So as you see these amplitude of the power spectra over the CMB scales here are extremely suppressed for these models and there is a strong scale dependence over the small scales for these models. Now uh, so this kind of uh, behavior will never lead to what we see today. So now we have tried to overcome these challenges and even we have found one model, single field model which is the famous Starobinsky model where a, where a brief deviation from slow roll is sandwiched between two slow roll regions here and we have managed to construct a coupling function uh, uh, which can lead to a required amplitude and behavior. However, there is still a burst of oscillations in the intermediate scales. And these kind of uh, this solution came at the cost of a very heavy fine tuning of the coupling function. So yeah, so what is the better way of circumventing those challenges? 
So we have worked with the two field model which provides uh, the addition of the, ex this additional field here uh, provides a richer dynamics for inflation and when there is a, uh, when uh, due to this uh, B phi factor which is the coupling between the canonical scalar field phi and the non-canonical scalar field chi, uh, so the non-zero value of B phi gives rise to deviation from slow roll for two field model which can generate features in the scalar power spectrum for these two field models. So in these cases, as you see, uh, if you remember, the field was getting stuck there um, uh, after the point point of inflection. However, in this case, the field, one field slowly rolls down and when it become, oscillates and settles down at the bottom of the potential, the other field starts driving the dynamics of inflection, inflation, which is why our coupling functions, instead of becoming constant, it behaves, gives us the E power 2n behavior. So these are the scalar power spectra corresponding to, corresponding to the two models. And the corresponding power, power spectra of magnetic field and electric field behaves in the similar fashion that I have shown earlier for the slow roll models with some features which we could not uh, overcome. However, for the second model which we have, the second two field model which we have used to generate features in the scalar power spectrum over small scales, we obtain a nearly scale invariant behavior over the CMB scales. So, as you can see here, with the help of the two field model, we managed to obtain a amplitude and behavior of the magnetic field and electric field, which can lead to the uh, observed strength today. So now in the next part, we have uh, tried to see what are the imprints of these magnetic fields on the cosmic microwave background. So we have used these CAM and MACCAM codes to compute the contribution of the primordial magnetic fields on the CMB anisotropies. So the MACCAM generally computes the compensa compensative and uh, passive modes, compensated and passive modes, while the CAM code we have used to compute the standard electromag standard uh, spectra, CMB spectra and uh, the inflationary magnetic mode which is a spectrum spectra of the inflationary magnetic mode which is another scalar mode. So as you see here, the red line here represents the standard CMB spectra, the blue line the contribution due to the uh, inflationary magnetic mode, the green line here is due to the passive mode and the cyan line here is due to the uh, compensated mode and as uh, predicted since the magnetic field strength is uh, less than the uh, inflation, uh, inflation energy, so uh, uh, from the perturbation energy, so as expected we were, we got the contribution lesser than the standard CMB spectra, these three are the contributions due to the magnetic field. So uh, this is the summary of the talk. So we saw that um, the, the models, the single field inflationary models which generate features in the scalar power spectrum uh, can also generate features in the electric and magnetic power spectrum. So and the challenges there was the separation of the magnetic fields over the large scales and there is a strong scale dependent behavior over the small scales. So we have circumvented those challenges with the help of two field models, although there were certain strong features we could not avoid, however for certain models we managed to get the uh, strength which is consistent with the current observations. And uh, we have also uh, computed the contributions of the primordial magnetic fields with the CMB data which are consistent with the CMB. Thank you. Thank you very much Sagarika. Hi, good evening everyone or maybe rather good afternoon. So the topic I am going to uh, uh, talk about today is exploring the effect of extra dimension on neutron star structure and equation of the state. So let us start from some background uh, related studies people are doing. So exploring the existence of extra spatial dimension in uh, four dimensional space time is a fascinating aspect of understanding space time uh, uh, fundamental structure. Initially this extra dimension naturally emerged uh, due to string theory which actually deals with 10 or more dimensions. And later this idea of extra dimension actually uh, revisited uh, due to this uh, gauge hierarchy problem. This problem arises due to the significant and uh, seemingly uncorrelated uh, uh, hierarchy, hierarchy between the uh, electroweak symmetry uh, breaking scale 
and the Planck scale. On the other hand, there are some issues like uh, some theories are also there, which include the higher dimensional aspects like uh, Kaluja Klein uh, theory, uh, domain wall models, large extra dimension brain wall models, etc., which actually able to explain the fundamental disagreement between the general relativity and the quantum field theory. And also few guys uh, came across there uh, in explaining dark matter and dark energy in the basis of the idea of the higher dimension. So now people are always excited about how the observational evidence are, are there. So there are few studies which actually says that uh, gravitational waves and the electro, uh, in terms of gravitational waves, there is actually some signature of, possible signature of higher dimension is there. So gravitational waves and electromagnetic wave from the same source should have equal luminosity distance, as we know, in the four uh, dimensional space and time. But people have shown that, that if gravitational wave propagates in the higher dimensional space time and as usual electromagnetic field which uh, actually confined in the, within the three dimensional subspace, so there should be some uh, uh, propagation delay. And uh, for example, in the uh, latest uh, multi-messenger gravitational wave event, uh, this is 170817, there it has been uh, showed that uh, gravitational wave luminosity distance is 40 megaparsec for the electromagnetic uh, counterpart. Uh, uh, no, so for the gravitational wave counterpart and for the electromagnetic wave luminosity distance is 40.7 uh, megaparsec with respective error bars. And obviously now one cannot actually ignore that two luminosity distances are not equal and uh, this idea cannot be dismissed. On the other uh, uh, hand, uh, in the same event, there was the time delay between the arrival of the gravitational wave signal and the corresponding light signal from the same source. So the uh, people come with several idea. Idea was like this, if uh, uh, gravitational wave is actually traveling in the uh, higher dimensional, uh, space time and the uh, electromagnetic field is uh, uh, traveling in the brain which is not actually flat then it is possible that in uh, terms of the four dimensional space time the gravitational wave is actually coming earlier corresponding to the electromagnetic wave but obviously considering the higher dimensional aspect they are able to show that in a total picture the gravitational wave is not actually exiting the speed of light so as a neutron star enthusiastic people uh, standing in this strong whisper, we are really interested about whether it is there or it is not there, we are not, uh, so we are not in that. We like to introduce this idea and uh, show how this idea uh, actually influencing the neutron star much. That is actually our motto. So based on that, uh, we have now challenges like uh, this. For the Newton star, we have to build a, uh, we have to incorporate the higher dimensional aspect in developing the stellar structure. Then we have to incorporate this idea to developing the uh, equation state, that how higher dimension actually affecting the equation state. And lastly, we have to show that whatever solution we are getting, that is consistent with the uh, general relativistic physical bounds. Uh, most probably the uh, equilibrium things, those things. So let's start. So we have started with the simple einstein hilbert action, but in the uh, d-dimensional space time, and the weak field you can easily found the value of the constant as given in the equation two, where s is basically the area of the sphere of unit radius in d-dimensional. Uh, as given in the equation number three. So we prefer to choose the mostly minus uh, space time as evident from the equation number four, which shows the energy momentum tensor. And based on all this, we can actually able to arrive the Einstein field equation, which explains the uh, Einstein, uh, Einstein, uh, corresponding to the space time of the d-dimensional space time. So this is shown in the equation number five. Now we have considered the interior space time of the uh, interior d-dimensional space time is actually defined by this metric given in equation number six. And based on the Einstein field equation, we can write them as a co component wise as given in seven, eight, nine. And immediately uh, doing the vacuum solution, we can actually uh, predict the exterior short cell space time metric for the d-dimension as given in the equation number 10. So immediately we have short cell space time, we can actually consider the interior uh, spatial component of the metric should 
take from like the equation number 11 and immediately we can have the definition of the mass for the D, uh, uh, compact star in the d dimensional space time as given in equation number 12. So we are ready actually with the essential stellar structure equation which in other term actually calls Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov equation. So the so we are going to solve these two equations simultaneously and arrive to the mass radius curve. But before that we have few challenges like this. Uh, uh, we don't know the equation of state, equation state we are going to develop and the other thing all the framework will be in the higher dimensional aspect where the gravitational constants also will be different uh, from the four dimensional cases. So those we are going to uh, take in our account. So here we choose to use actually density dependent relativistic hadron field theory in nuclear equation state and we consider that uh, the uh, the variants are actually interacting to uh, with uh, uh, through uh, two isoscalar mission isoscalar uh, vector mission and strange isoscalar missions but uh, later we have considered that since the effect of the strange isoscalar mission for example scalar missions effect is very negligible and vector mission do not interact on the nucleons so we uh, did not consider finally the strange isoscalar missions to so we uh, we actually proceeded with the two isoscalar mission and isoscalar uh, isovector mission and based on that the total lagrangian is given in the equation number 15 so now we can actually come to the field equation related to the uh, missions. Th those are given in the 16, 17, and 18. Uh, and uh, you can see the effect of the higher dimensionality is already there in the through the equation number 19 and 20. And equation number 21 uh, is the basically the effective uh, baryon mass. And uh, this equation number 21 is the uh, equ uh, equation of the baryon field. And uh, so finally all the field equation we have and we have also the expression for the density and pressure as given in the equation number 23 and 24. Note that here uh, uh, everywhere the effect of the higher dimensionality is al already incorporated and in the pressure, uh, pressure I, the last term in the uh, upper line, those term is extra that is ca uh, coming because we are considering this equation state is density dependent. So all the coupling constants are basically density dependent, that's why those things are coming. So, so, yeah. So now we have considered the coupling constants are density dependent. So based on that we have consider some uh, functional form of the coupling constants and it is widely accepted forms. We have just took those things and so equation state is also ready for us and based on that uh, solving those two of equation we have actually arrived to this set of the mass radius curve. So left uh, extreme left panel is the mass radius curve for the different dimensions. You can see that uh, the green one is basically the four dimension, usual one, and the blue one, basically fifth dimension, and red one is the sixth dimension. Except, except of that, uh, we tried to see uh, the more two cases for uh, separately for five dimension and six dimension. Why so? Because we, as we said that we don't know the gravitational constant for the higher dimension, so we have considered a, uh, this g dy g4. Uh, uh, GDYG, this, uh, uh, this is a free parameter that we have chosen. So for the five dimension based on this free parameter, we can actually have the set of the mass radius equation and similarly in the six dimensions, same we can get. Next we have studied the mass versus central density and likewise GR, we can find that dm by d rho c, that is m is the total mass and rho c is the central density. This dm by d rho c is uh, greater than zero uh, up to the maximum mass which is another uh, stability criteria in the case of GR. But <coughs> we also checked another stability criteria uh, that I am going to show you. Uh, and also further we have studied the interior structure of the stars for the all uh, dimensions. So we have studied the pressure and shown the equation state in the respectively in the left and right panel. So here we have finally studied <coughs> the stability criteria. We have shown that uh, uh, the Chandrasekhar pulsation through the Chandrasekhar pulsation equation that our all the for all the cases our stellar structure is actually stable. You can see the fundamental uh, uh, mode is actually greater than zero for the three cases, which actually says that 
uh, or the uh, uh, stars we have, uh, stellar structure we have given through the uh, higher dimension is actually stable stars. And we have also studied the Boosdal condition. We have developed the Boosdal limit for the d-dimensional space time given there. And you can see for all the cases, it is actually not violating the Boosdal condition. We have to, we have to, we try to check the surface redshift. And you can see it is not also exiting the critical limit uh, way beyond for the maximum mass two. And I think you should summarize now. Yeah, yeah. So summary is like, so finally the summary is if higher dimension is there, so we actually come up with some uh, model which actually can suitably explain the effect of the higher dimensionality. So this work has been collaborated with uh, my postdoctoral mentor, uh, Professor Manjiri Bakshi, and Professor Shamish Tabal. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for accommodating these short talks. And hence, I am able to give my talk here and also thank them for organizing this beautiful conference. Uh, so I would like to mention that my entire work during my PhD at Iser Kolkata is on the application of Raichaudhuri equation in different gravitational systems. And so therefore, I'm very uh, happy and I am feel pleased that I'm here to talk about this Raichaudhuri equation in this conference. And during my PhD, PhD days, I uh, started my work after reading the review of Professor Fionkar and Professor Swamitra Sengupta, and they are also here. So, okay, so I, uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Towards the Quantum Person of the Rai Chaudhuri Equation and the Resulting Rai Chaudhuri Effect. So, as discussed by Professor Sion yesterday that uh, the Raichudur equation is a very general equation with a wide range of applicability. And he also mentioned about uh, uh, the research work that is currently going on uh, to develop a quantum version of the Raichudur equation. And my, uh, so, so this work is an endeavor in this direction. So I will directly start from the Raichudur equation, thanks to Professor Sion Kaur, who has already set the stage for me. So uh, this is the Raichudur equation for a time-like geodesic congruence, which has a velocity u alpha in n plus 1 dimensions. This d theta d tau is equal to minus 1 by n theta square, plus uh, minus sigma square plus omega square minus r mu nu, u mu, u nu, where theta is the expansion scalar, tau is the proper time, sigma mu nu is the shear tensor, h mu nu is the spatial metric which is induced from the space time metric, omega is the rotation tensor and r alpha beta is the Dicke tensor. So I will not go into the details of these quantities as already discussed by Professor Fionkar beautifully yesterday. Uh, so and uh, from his talk I picked the name Raichaudhuri effect. So the most important co consequence of the Raichaudhuri equation is the focusing of geodesics and that is actually the Raichaudhuri effect. So the statement of Raichaudhuri effect is that a hypersurface orthogonal geodesic congruence will always focus within a finite proper time if the strong energy condition holds. And this leads to the discovery of the famous singularity theorem by Hawking and Penrose. So to prove the existence of singularities in space time, this Raichaudhuri effect is absolutely necessary. So, so our aim is to see what happens in the quantum design. Um, if this geodesic focusing occurs in the quantum design, so to develop a quantum version of the Raichaudhuri equation, first we have to uh, quantize the system of a uh, geodesic congruence. So, to, so the method is that, so first we have to construct a dynamical system and its Lagrangian so that the Raichaudhuri equation follows as the Euler-Lagrange equation from that. So that dynamical system will co 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 correspond to the geodesic co co congruence and then we find the proper Hamiltonian, use the ca ca canonical commutation relations and quantize the system. So for that first we have to find, find a dynamical variable which can represent this system. So let us consider that this is, a, this is a two 
proline of this congruence and we take uh, constant proper time hi uh, hypersurfaces and so and the space time metric induces a metric h alpha beta on these hypersurfaces we take the de determinant of that metric and take the square root and the and this will give the dynamical variable rho okay now this expansion parameter is theta expansion parameter theta is related to rho via this relation so we can write the rai choudhury equation completely in terms of rho so the rai choudhury equation in n plus 1 dimensions where we have uh, so uh, assume that the uh, congruence is hypersurface orthogonal geodesic time like congruence and this is the rai choudhury equation in terms of rho where this curly r is the scalar r mu nu u mu nu and 2 sigma square is the sigma alpha beta sigma alpha beta now we have to f find a Lagrangian from which this equation follows. And that needs some involved techniques called Helmholtz condition. I will not go into the detail, but the proper Lagrangian is given by this expression. So this is the Lagrangian from which the, uh, the Euler, the, uh, the Raichudur equation follows as the uh, Euler Lagrange equation. Given that the, this V potential term uh, that satisfies this re relation. At this point, I should mention that this formalism, so we at first we started to develop a general formalism, but we found that, that this formalism is valid for a uh, limited case and when rho is a single variable function. For example, in homogeneous cosmology, rho is a function of cosmic time. In that case, this will uh, do the job. Having said that, we can construct the conjugate variable, which is pi del L by del rho prime. And this is related to expansion via this expression. And then we can find the Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian for the system. Now we say use this commutation relation so to quantize the system, where this rho and pi are lifted to operators and the operator form of pi is given by minus i cross del del rho. And we write the evolution equation as a Schrodinger type equation. So this is the Hamiltonian which acts on psi and this is i h cross del psi del t, where psi is the geometric flow state and we can uh, say that this is like a wave function for the, uh, the system of geodesic congruence. And so this equation will now uh, dictate the evolution of the geodesic congruences in the quantum design. So this is a quantum analog of the Rai Chaudhuri equation, we can say. And there are few important conclusions which follows from this, uh, this expression, sorry. So, so here we can see that this, this is the effective mass term, which, which is equal to rho to the power 2, n, 2 by n minus 2. And this effective mass term goes to infinity as rho tends to 0. And rho tends to 0 means the volume, the cross-sectional volume at any instant of time goes to 0, which means focusing of congruences. And as m effective goes to infinity, it means that the, the, there is an effective infinite potential. So the boundary condition would be to choose phi equal to 0 as rho tends to 0, which means a vanishingly small probability of focusing. And also an, uh, another important conclusion is that, so in this, uh, so here the, 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 there is a problem of non-unitary evolution, but here the Hamiltonian ad admits a self-adjoint extension if we define the norm in this way. So therefore the problem of arriving at a non-unitary evolution is resolved. Okay, so these are the main conclusion. Now, before concluding talk, I want to discuss a few important notes. So I have included some uh, references in my slides. So these first three slides actually um, uh, motivates my work. So this, uh, so this endeavor started with the work of Soryo Das in 2014, where using Bohemian trajectories, he showed that the, that the focusing does not occur. And after that, this uh, work came by Sumanthu Chakraborty and Dao Kothawal and Alejandro Pesci, who showed that focusing that doesn't occur if we include a zero point length. And also these works, all these three and my work 
uh, indicates that the, in the quantum design, focusing will be prevented. But very recently, this work came where the author demanded that the quantum effects will uh, uh, help in focusing. So there are many, so, so these two demands are actually contradictory and there are many more going on and we will see what happens in the future. So I will end this, this with this acknowledgement. We are grateful to Professor Thanu Padmanabhan for his enlightenment comment on an earlier draft which uh, have some issues and we resolve these issues and I also uh, thankful to Dr. Kesakand Bhattacharya for his useful suggestion. And I will end here. And these are the references which I used to prepare my talk. Please have a look at them. And thank you. Thank you very much. So here is my title of my presentation, The Light Bending Phenomena for a Pulsar Black Hole Binary. In this work, we consider a pulsar is situated in a uh, binary system with a uh, Schwarzschild black hole. And in this uh, system, we, uh, we want to study the effects on the pulsar signals, how it propagates through the uh, uh, black hole uh, gravitational field of the black holes and how it affects the pulsar timing. And then next, we uh, study how the pulse profile will be affected by the uh, gravitational field of the component. So <coughs> as we know, Pulsars are basically highly rotating magnetized neutron stars and those are mainly observed in the radio frequencies and those are very useful tools to study gravitational physics. Here is the basic geometry for the for an isolated pulsars. Here you can see xi, yi, zi axis is the uh, stationary frame that is situated at the center of the pulsars. The spin axis is along the zi axis. The magnetic axis is along the mi axis. Uh, Magnetic is along the mi axis and this magnetic axis rotates around the spin axis by an angle alpha. So the path of this rotation is generated by the B. Now the, we use the Radhakrishnan Cook model in which the pulsars emit radiation in a shape of a conal beam. Here you can see that the, around the magnetic axis we have a conal beam and this is making an half opening angle of this cone is rho. Now the, my, our line of sight is along this uh, ni cap directions which is in xi zi plane. Now as it rotates the pulsars the cross section of the beam will cut a certain time the line of sights and when it cuts the line of sights observer will receive a signal and as it uh, rotate the line of sight will cuts a trajectory throughout the cross section of the beam which has a certain width and this width is given by this formula where phi zero is the half width of the pulse profiles and this is related with the half opening angle of the cone and the collateral width of the line of sight zeta l and the um, uh, spin axis and magnetic axis alignment a angle alpha. So <coughs> by uh, so this is the basic geometry for the uh, isolated pulsar systems and here we calculate the magnetic axis directions and the arbitrary light ray directions ni cap denoted by this formula. Next uh, we the intensity that we receive the uh, pulsar say, shape that we receive from the signal depends on the intensity distribution on the cross section of the beam. Now the Radha uh, Rankin first proposed the three component beam model which is uh, has two, two, three, one core components and two cone components one is inner cone and outer cone and in this uh, model the depending on the tra trajectory along which the line of sight cuts the beam that we get the different component of the pulse profiles. If suppose line of sight cuts at the middle of the beam then we get five component pulse profile two coming from outer cone and two coming from inner cone and another is uh, core component. Similarly, if line of sight catch a different path, then we'll get single and triple and four, fourth component also possible to explain by this model. So using this model, we construct the beam first and those are the relevant equations to construct those uh, this beam. So using those equations, we construct this beam of five component models and our pulse profile will look like this. Now comes to the pulsar in binary. So most of the pulsars, uh, almost 3,000 pulsars are observe, observed uh, now up to dates, and then almost 10 much 10 percent of that only are found in binary. And uh, the bla pulsar black hole binaries are very interesting object which are yet to found, but uh, this will be very useful tools to study the gravitational physics. So we. Uh, here we first uh, describe the geometry of a uh, binary pulsars. In here, the red plane is the sky plane of the pulsars, and the line of sight will be perpendicular to this plane, denoted by this ni cap. Now we uh, consider a frame x s y s z s axis in in the sky plane, and this is denoted by the s frames. The blue plane is the orbital plane of the pulsars, in which the uh, x b axis along the longer periastron of the orbit, and this frame is denoted by the b frame. Now. 
uh, here we introduce uh, angles I, which is the inclination angle of the orbits, and the inclination and the angle omega, which is the longitude of the, longitude of the periastron. These two angles relates this B frame with the S frames. And similarly, we denoted two angles lambda and eta here. This lambda and eta angle basically defines the spin axis in the sky plane. And th using those two angles, these two angles relates the spin axis frame with the S frame. So here we shows the transformations between the different frames axis. So using those transformations, any vector that we calculated in the isolated frame of the pulsars can be transformed in the B frame using these relations. And we did this because we did all the calculations in the B frame. So next in the bending delay. So <coughs> when pulsars in a binary systems, then the pulsars uh, emitted light emitted by the pulsars moves through the, uh, around the gravitational field of the component produces propagation delay. And this propagation delay splits into three in a weak field limits. Those are rumor delay, sapphire delay, and geometric delay. But beside those delays, there is another kind of delays coming due to the bending of the light. This is known as the bending delay. That is uh, here I am going to explain the bending delay. So it is in I frame, we, our line of sight is along, um, the XI, uh, along in XIZI plane. So so in these situations when bending is not present, the light ray which has collatitude zeta L and phase 0 will be aligned with the line of sight and will be observed by the mm, observer. But due to the presence of the uh, bending, the light ray which has different uh, collatitude which is denoted by zeta without and different phase phi without becomes parallel with the line of sight after bending. So we can see due to bending the light ray coming to the observers, the collatitude and the phase of the light ray will be changed and then change in the phase of the light ray gives the the longitudinal bending delay defined by this. Essentially, in our case, this phi will be zero. So this is the longitudinal known as the longitudinal bending delay. And the change in the collatitudes gives the latitudinal bending delay. This is defined here. Here is the that latitudinal bending delay change in de defined that uh, change in the collatitudes basically change the width of the pulse profile uh, given by this formula. And we change in the width of the pulse profile leads to the latitudinal bending delay. But here one uh, uh, thing is that that change in the collatitudes that change causes to change in the width this formula is only applicable only for when the cross section of the beam is circular but when it is not but we first time we showed that the, due to the presence of the bending this circular cross section will be distorted and this formula will not be valid which we will show for the pulsar baffle binary systems so using those formulas we first, first trace the orbit of the pulsars so that the, to uh, situate the uh, position of the pulsar in the orbit uh, so we use the post kepler parameters in there and next we study the light bending uh, la, geodesics na, of light rays in the Schwarzschild space times and this is the formalism we have used i am not going into details but and those are the formulas to relevant formulas to calculate the uh, light ray directions uh, after the bendings and from using those here we first find the uh, final direction of the light ray from the initial direction of the light ray. And the, uh, note that this is the in L infinity denotes that the light ray direction in the L frame and this L frame is the light ray frame which is uh, related with the uh, Schwarzschild co coordinate systems. But we have to calculate all the things into the B frame. So here we have to use that another transformation relations which are described here which converts the in final direction of the light ray in the uh, B frame. So using those uh, formalism or these formalisms we get the initial give the initial positions and initial direction of a light ray, they will transform to the final direction of the light ray. And once we get the final direction of the light ray, we can calculate bending delay by calculating the collatitudes and the uh, latitude, uh, longitude of this light ray uh, to calculate the um, bending delay. So using this formula, we calculate bending delay. So earlier studies, uh, Snyder first proposed this bending delay with uh, this is first proposed the bending delay and after Dorosongo Kopeking studies this bending delay in more details. But uh, the Rofikov and Lai comes with the more details, uh, provide more uh, uh, accurate expressions for the longitudinal and latitudinal bending delay. So as a test first, we first calculate the longitudinal and latitudinal bending delay and compare our results with the Rofikov and Lai expressions and Dorosongo Kopeking expressions. And here we can see that our result exactly matching with the Rofikov and Lai results, uh, but uh, some, diffuse, some uh, unmatched happened for the Dorosongo Kopikin expressions. So we can say that our formalism is correct which, as it is matching with the more accurate expression of Rafikan ally. Next we see that the, in the when the inclination of the orbit very close to the 90 degree, the, our formalism shows some discontinuity which is not present in uh, Rafikan ally expression. And this discontinuity can be explained by these figures that when pulsar is in a exact superior conjunction positions, in these positions the light ray uh, pulsars will be a, exactly at the back end of the black hole and in this position the light ray from this cone 
all the light rays from these cones will converge to the line of sight and this causes for the discontinuity in the uh, pulsar ba ba bending delay curve. So now bending delay for pulsar black hole binary systems, we use those parameters to calculate the bending delay for pulsar black hole binary systems and we calculate first with, with uh, uh, inclination 87.5 degree, we can check the, our formalisms with Rafika Verlai and uh, Dorosongo Kopikin, we can see that our formalism is valid for throughout the uh, all orbit of the pulsar, where Rafika Verlai valid only near the superior conjunctions. Next, we calculate that, uh, as I told, that the del phi zero, which is the change in the width, only valid for analytical formula, only valid if the cross section is uh, circular. So we have to calculate this del phi zero numerically. And here is the formula that we calculate the del phi zero num numerically. That del t is the time uh, uh, for which the uh, line of sight will remain with the cross section of the beam if the bending is not present. And del t prime, same as if bending is present. So the, by this formula, we can calculate del phi zero numerically. And we showed that for inclination 87 0.5 degree, this del phi zero uh, matching we exactly with the Rafika Verlai expression and our expression. But as we increase the inc inclinations, these expressions give some diff different result, which I showed first, first times. And those are the some curves that of bending delay with different mass and different binary parameter changing. Next, we come to the uh, distortion of the beam. We can see that for inclination angle 90 degree and uh, orbital phase 90 degree, our line of sight will rem uh, exactly remains at the line of sight, pulsars and black hole remains in the same line and in these situations the black hole acts as a convex lens and our intensity around the line of sight always remains higher, mu mu much higher than that. And here we can also see that the be beam get distorted and some of the photon rays will cross the beam boundary which is causes for the change in the latitudinal bending delay. And here for some another angles, different angles and different orbital phases, we shows the distortion of the beam here. And this is corresponding to the pulse profile. This is for 89.7 degree. We can see you the you pulse. You should summarize now. Uh, now, just four slides. So the, the 89.7 degree, just um, intensity uh, get uh, slightly distorted. And for 89.8 degree, we can see that intensity is distorted more. And it is maximum when the inclination is close to 90 degree. So in this work, so in summary, we just check the, so what is the effect of the uh, pulsar timing due to the bending. And the then we study the what will be the change in the pulsar shape due to the bending. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chol. So, okay, so my uh, my talk is divided into two parts. Part one, I will discuss how gravity decoys quantum system, where first I discuss and uh, give a brief introduction to quantum decoherence and uh, how is it related to uh, emerging classicality. Then I will discuss uh, the uh, gravitational decoherence, the bell loan proposal. Mostly I will discuss the PZCB model. And then our proposal that incorporate true gravitational effect. In the second part, uh, we are going to check the substitution of M to M plus H naught by C square. Here H into the internal uh, degree of freedom uh, dynamics, the whose, whose dynamics are governed by the uh, H into uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, yeah, then f uh, the finally our results. Yeah. So one of the most striking feature of quantum theory is the quantum superposition principle. However, we, uh, however, quantum superposition are not observed on everyday macroscopic scale. But why? What is the reason behind it? Uh, like uh, uh, the lot of uh, people or community in the research area consider whether it is like uh, uh, due to quantum decoherence, so I'm going to discuss what is the uh, quantum decoherence or, so what is de uh, decoherence? Decoherence is simply loss of quantum coherence due to the interaction with the external environment. This typically happens when a system is coupled to many degree of freedom in the environment. If the system and environment become entangled, uh, the reduced density matrix of the system alone become mixed, that reflect the loss of, uh, loss of coherence. So now, uh, I'm just introducing the gravity in the picture of uh, quantum decoherence. So on the one hand, we have uh, gravitational time dilation. On the other hand, we have a uh, quantum complementarity. From GR, we know that uh, clock closure to the massive body ticks slower than uh, the clock further away. On the other hand, we know the quantum complementarity says uh, we cannot simultaneously know the path of the particle and observe the quantum inter interference. This is the picture depicting, uh, so this is the, uh, heavy heavy mass uh, and the clock is in the superposition of two paths. The path closer to the massive body ticks slower and uh, the other one will uh, uh, 
take fast uh, relative to that one. So it, it is just saying that uh, uh, so we cannot uh, uh, we cannot see the path coherence in presence of the massive body. Yeah. So like okay. So this is the. Uh, uh, introduction, like uh, so, how to measure the decoherence? What is the uh, so? I'm going to present the mathematical aspect of measuring decoherence. So uh, there is a, uh, there is a object called interferometric visibility uh, that that measure the uh, coherence of the system, and actually it measure the off diagonal terms of uh, density matrix. Uh, that incorporate the information of coherence or decoherence. So if you have some one system with some internal degree of freedom, just write the uh, initial density matrix. Uh, if you have uh, the Hamiltonian, H free, H internal, and H coupling. Just time evaluate the uh, density matrix at time t, just trace out the internal degree of freedom. Or if you have environment, just uh, trace out the entire environment degree of freedom. The uh, At time t, you have uh, density matrix, after tracing out the internal degree of freedom, that's called the reduced density matrix. And the off diagonal terms of that reduced density matrix, that is mathematically measured by the interferometric visibility. If visibility is 1, that means uh, there is no loss of decoherence. And visibility is 0 uh, means uh, it's a loss of coherence. It's a complete decoherence. Yeah, so now I'm going to jump to the PZCB model. We are peer, P is a Pekoski, Jai, Costa, and Bruckner model. So uh, they have uh, considered some composite system uh, whose Hamiltonian is given by this P square by 2m plus m square plus, uh, phi is some, some gravitational potential. So the last term will be mgh only. So if that uh, composite system has some internal degree of freedom whose dynamics are governed by some Hamiltonian, that's h int here. So the final uh, final Hamiltonian will be like this. Uh, the, the the purple color uh, box that H int coupling with phi that's incorporate the new effect. So uh, here visibility. Uh, if we calculate the visibility, that only only the couple uh, the terms uh, highlighted in the purple color that will uh, reflect in the end. Yeah, so uh, this is the particular example they have considered. Uh, uh, so internal degree of freedom, uh, they have considered like a uh, lot of bu bunch of harmonic oscillator and uh, G uh, potential to be uh, gravitational potential. So uh, this will be like MGH. Just writing the in, uh, initial density matrix uh, where uh, psi CM is a, uh, just consider the center of mass of the composite system is in superposition of two state, one and two. So psi CM will be the one by under root two, X1 and X2. X1 and X2 are the, the two state uh, where the center of mass or degree of freedom can be in superposition. And uh, uh, we, we, uh, just time evaluate this one using the uh, this uh, Hamiltonian. Yeah, so uh, if we calculate uh, this uh, uh, at uh, some particular temperature that uh, uh, that uh, considered to be high temperature, high temperature limit, the de uh, visibility comes out to be like this. And the uh, decoherence time, time comes out to be uh, like this. Like if here G is the uh, uh, gravitational um, potential. So. So here the visibility is comes out to be like uh, expectation value of e to the power minus uh, h not h not is actually the internal Hamiltonian h int and delta tau is the proper time difference between these two paths. So if uh, there is uh, proper time difference between these two paths, there will be the visibility uh, reducing the visibility that reflect to the decoherence. Yeah. So uh, what uh, what is the problem with this formalism? And uh, so since they are claiming this, the decoherence is happening due to gravity, but uh, there are a lot of literature that uh, that claims, uh, including us, that this decoherence derived by Pekoski, uh, Pekoski ATL, like just actually kinematical effect, and that can be nullified in certain uh, frame of reference because in the in the in the decoherence time only g delta x is appearing. So just go to the freely falling frame. Uh, acceleration will be zero, so th th there is no loss of coherence. So th th this is actually a kinematical effect. It's not a real gravitational effect. To demonstrate true gravitational effect, we need uh, uh, we need to include some tidal tidal effects that uh, reflect the true nature of gravity. So though experimentally considering the tidal effect may not make much difference, but here our goal is to prove that whether gravity uh, decohere or not. 
Yeah, so this is a uh, 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 Fermi normal coordinate uh, which uh, we will be using in the, uh, our formalism. Uh, just saying that, uh, uh, so on the, on the red curve, uh, the uh, space-time matrix looks like, uh, uh, lo will be the flat matrix. Away from this one, this will be the matrix. And uh, here the gray color slice is the perpendicular to that uh, velocity vector of, of that gamma. So it's kind of three plus one kind of decomposition. Yeah, so, so this we have considered the composite system, which is in the, the center of mass of the composite system is in the superposition of two parts, x1 and x2. On the particular time slice, like t is equals to zero, uh, the, uh, these are distances are S, s1 and s2, and the delta s is the difference between these two points. So just, just uh, doing, uh, calcul calculating the uh, Hamiltonian, writing down the Hamiltonian in the Fermi normal coordinate, which is, uh, is equals to minus P zero down. So uh, just uh, doing bit of calculation, we will, uh, we will reach, uh, we reach at uh, like H three plus H int one plus theta, where theta is a minus P square by M square and uh, A mu X mu uh, plus uh, elective part of Riemann tensor. So, but with the elective part of Riemann tensor that explicitly incorporated the curvature, uh, curvature that the proposed the effect is generally gravitational. Unlike the uh, previous formalism where A mu X mu was the only terms uh, that, that comes out to be like GX, and but that that can be in, uh, uh, that can be goes to zero in the freely falling form, for example. So, but there are also higher order terms. Uh, they are given in the paper. But uh, I, for for the uh, for here, I'm just discussing the uh, the impact of uh, our result. That okay, we have incorporated the true gravitational effect due to the tidal tensor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the visibility. Uh, okay. So yeah. So for, for the for the comparison purpose with the uh, PZ theory model. Uh, here the decoherence, uh, decoherence time we have calculated in the similar setup, uh, that comes out to be like uh, their explicit appearance of uh, like part of Riemann tensor and uh, apart from these terms. So even though if uh, you make this term to be zero, there are, there are uh, decoherence. Like, but okay, so just consider uh, uh, for more uh, like comparison, just consider the, some uh, values and that comes out to be 10 to the power minus three decoherence time. And uh, in our uh, uh, our formalism, we just consider uh, the uh, the ma lab on the Earth. So we need uh, uh, to set up the Fermi normal coordinate to Earth. We need uh, like uh, interior metric of Earth. Uh, just writing down the interior metric of Earth and uh, just calculating all the terms. Just solving the Einstein equation, uh, this metric, and just putting down every values. Uh, that comes out to be like the same 10 to the power minus three. So here, uh, this stems uh, purely due to this elective part of Riemann tensor. Uh, so we have incorporated uh, the same effect uh, due to the uh, due to the uh, tidal tidal effect. Yeah. So this is the part two of the uh, of our uh, paper. Like uh, we are uh, we are going to uh, discuss whether the gravitational interaction also coupled to the given background curvature in the same manner as uh, as the point mass can be replaced m to m h int by c square everywhere. Yeah. So for that we we have considered one setup that uh, capital M um, uh, is the big mass and uh, small m is a smaller mass. Uh, that uh, capital M is in the uh, some background curvature and also capital M also back reacting to the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, these different zones are uh, mathematically differ by uh, these values. Uh, and a small m is in is in the uh, is in the environment where the, there is a curvature due to background and the curvature due to self gravity of uh, capital M. And uh, just cal calculating the metric and cal just calculate the Hamiltonian. So that Hamiltonian comes out to be like this. Uh, just so go to the results. And go to the yeah, yeah. Results. This is the last one. Yeah. So uh, we can clearly see that uh, that H int is coupling in the same fashion with the, uh, with the curvature, external curvature as M is coupling, but there are some extra terms that uh, that's not coupling with the M. Yeah, so we, we, we cannot uh, naively put M to M plus H and Y C square uh, that uh, has done by the Pekoski and other work. Yeah, so this is the conclusion that uh, decoherence derived by PZCV actually, actually a kinematical and that can be nullified in certain reference frame. 
and uh, there will be no loss of uh, coherence even for the uniformly accelerated observer when AMU is such that that ex exactly cancel the uh, R0 mu0 nu terms. Uh, we have also shown that uh, uh, the for the decoherence time obtained using the Riemann tensor do agree with one using acceleration accelerate frame in the PJCB model, at least for the experiment done on the spherically symmetric source. And uh, whether like the coupling of the gravitational interaction to the external environment uh, can be determined in the, uh, uh, determined in the same, uh, same universal manner as the coupling of non-gravitational uh, gravitational interaction is determined, we just prove that yeah, our, our analysis shows that uh, this is not true. Uh, and hence, we cannot, we cannot naively replace M to H into Y C square in general, uh, mostly in the case where agent is the self-gravity of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Raghavendra. A nice talk. Questions, comments? Okay, let us thank all the speakers of this session, including